All right. Well, I am so glad everybody is here tonight. You know what's kind of difficult is, and you guys probably do the same thing, except for those that probably have their camera right at the top of their computer screen. You're always wanting to, I'm always looking at you guys and I'm not looking at the camera. You know, it's like, what are you looking at? You're always looking down, you know? So I always notice that you can tell when people have good camera placement. Um, anyway, we're going to, we're going to actually go back into this subject that I shared with y'all, but mainly because I've gotten some, I went deeper into it. And that's when I talked about that, uh, that fig tree in the apocalypse of Peter. Um, and again, I just want to remind you guys, when we're looking at books like that, keep in mind, um, these books are not biblical canon. Uh, so when I, when I share this information with you, it's conjecture. I, I don't want it to be doctrine because, you know, and I don't want anybody to be confused by that. It's just looking at it from a historical point because they are historical. I don't use books that we don't have a historical uh, validation, but books that are historical that uh, that have very interesting content. Um, so I I did, but one of the things that I really liked about this, and I got to find where this is all at now. I don't know which one it's at. Um what I found to be interesting uh, is that, I mean, I got a lot of stuff up here to share with you guys tonight, so just first find the right thing here. All right, this is the, uh, now there are, by the way, just so you guys know, that I think there are three different types of books with the name called the Apocalypse of Peter or the Revelation of Peter. Um, there is one in Egypt's Nag Hammadi writings. It's totally different than the, than the one I have here on the screen. This one uh, is, uh, I think this one's considered to be like one of the apocrypha works. Um, the reason for this not being canonized. There was actually really only one reason that I have seen from scholars that wrote about it. And it's not from this particular version that we have here, but there was, an, there was another manuscript of the same sort. Um, and basically uh, from what I have read, I've never read that actual source, but they say that Peter had everybody being saved at the end of the day, and that's why they would not accept it as part of the can uh, can canonical scriptures there. Um, now, whether or not, you know, like I said, you know, was that the actual document or was it something somebody added? Um, there's a lot of that that I wonder about. In, in all cases like this, in this particular rendition of the Apocalypse of Peter, we don't have that. Um, it's the same thing like the two witnesses. Uh, he puts in here Enoch and Elijah. Uh, so in one way, I would say I stand corrected because I've always thought it would be Elijah and Moses. Um, but at the same time, if there's questions about changes that are made could that have been changed later down the road too it may be or it may be that truly it is enoch and elijah and i stand corrected so uh, for me i'm always to, willing to take the correction because i know I, i'm not perfect i don't have everything right um but what i'm really wanting to dive into is we're going to be looking at the book of revelation the book of hebrews uh, and a latter portion of the book of Revelation in regards to what we're looking at right here. Let me make sure I get this, kind of make sure I kind of watch in case we have other people pop in. So let me figure out a way to put things so that I don't mess people up that want to come in and listen tonight. I'm probably, normally I'll post this on Patreon and then later sometimes I'll put it up on YouTube, but I may go ahead and just put this one up on YouTube right away. Um, I just find, because I find this really fascinating, what we're going to get into here. 
Um, I want to come back to chapter two of that writing there, and we'll read this again. And keep in mind, as we're looking at this, um, we're looking at just like in Matthew chapter 24, except it's like a little mini version of that. Um, you know, because when you start in chapter one, they're over on the Mount of Olives, uh, and he's talking about, you know, the temple, and then they're asking the questions, when are these things going to happen? Just like we see in Matthew 24, and he begins to answer, but it's a very short version answer compared to what we have in Matthew. Uh, but when you get over here in chapter two, he says here, and you learn a parable from the fig tree, as soon as it's Shoots have come forth and the twigs grown. The end of the world shall come. Now, in Matthew 24, he just simply tells us, learn the parable of the fig tree. When, it shoot, when its branches are yet tender, know that summer is even nigh, even at the door. Now, paraphrasing that, of course. But that gives us what he says there. But he never explains it over there. Here, he goes into an explanation because Peter asked. He said, and I, Peter, answered and said to him, interpret the fig tree to me. How can we understand it? For throughout all its days, the fig tree sends forth shoots, and every year it brings forth its fruit for its master. What then does the parable of the fig tree mean? We do not know. And the master answered and said to me, do you not understand that the fig tree is the house of Israel? It is like a man who planted a fig tree in his garden, and it brought forth no fruit, and he sought the fruit many years. And when he did, uh, when he did not find it, he said to the keeper of his garden, Uproot the fig tree so that it does not make our ground unfruitful. And the gardener said to his master, Let us rid it of the weeds and dig the ground round about it and water it, and if then it does not bear fruit, we will straight rate uproot it from the garden and plant another in place of it. By the way, if you guys remember, um, I thought, Elizabeth, I thought you got knocked out of there. It's actually another Elizabeth coming on. So <laughs> I'm looking over there and I'm like, well, how did Elizabeth fall out? So <laughs> anyway, that particular version of the fig tree is spoken about in another book of Matthew as well, about the digging around it, etc. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, have you not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Now, this is where he gets into things that we're not familiar with. Verily I say to you, when its twigs have sprouted forth in the last days, then shall false Christ come and awake expectation saying, I am Christ, who has now come un into the world. Now, this is speaking about the last days, and he's talking about the house of Israel. All right, I'm going to go real slow on this, because there's some really interesting thoughts here I'm going to share with you. Some of it will be a repeat, but then we're going to go deeper, though. All right, that's why, so don't feel like we're doing the same thing. We are, we are on some level, but we're going to go deeper. And when they perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they shall turn away and deny him whom our fathers praised, the first Christ, whom they crucified, therein sinned a great sin. I know that sounds a little confusing at first when he writes that right there. Whom our fathers praised, they're talking about the, you know, the apostles when they did praise Jesus. But then he also talks about, you know, it's going to be, there's going to be a, a crucifixion. When they rejected him, he shall slay them with the sword, and there shall be many martyrs. Then shall the twigs of the fig tree, that is the house of Israel, shoot forth, going to the left side of the page now, many shall become martyrs at his hand. Enoch and Elijah shall be sent to teach them, that is the, uh, that is the deceiver who must come into the world and do signs and wonders in order to deceive. And therefore, those who die by his hand shall be martyrs and shall be reckoned among the good and righteous martyrs who have pleased God in their life. All right. Now, when I read this, the first issue that I ran into, and I didn't put this up here yet, so I'll add it, was, and it didn't take me long to figure out the answer to this. Um, whoop, 
Sorry about that. Hang on, I got that in the way. In Acts chapter 2, if you remember, I talk about this quite frequently. Because in Acts chapter 2, Paul records that Peter, where do I find a place to put this thing? Okay. You know what? I'll close it. It should pop up and show when somebody's coming in. Peter, when we get down to, you know, Acts 36 here, chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, if you recall, I've taught this many, many times that after those that were in the upper room came out, which was a representation of the house of Judah, that all these men of different nations that came out speaking, you know, they were, they said, how hear we every man in our own tongue? Uh, so how, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And of course, then it names all the countries they're from. And it uh, it goes on to say that these were that they were Jews, or actually the Greek word there is Judeans. See right there up here, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews or Judeans is the right translation, devout men out of every nation under heaven. But it wasn't all the house of Israel. If you remember, the scripture says, and and I, I'm doing this a little bit deeper because I don't want. I don't want there to be a confusion in our minds here, right? There was a remnant. And let me see if I can do this. Yeah, Romans speaks about it and also, but he's quoting from Isaiah 10. And let me see if I can blow this up big enough to for you guys to see it as well. Where is the thing that makes it do that? Oh, here it is. All right. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. All right. Now, Paul also quotes that passage in Romans 9.27. He said, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, as a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now, so the remnant that we just read, the prophecy actually is Isaiah chapter 10. OK, and that remnant is the, basically it's like the first har harvest of the house of Israel. Remember the two st sticks that Ephraim uh, that they bind together that uh, that he had in there is it's basically the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And I think he calls it Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim's often referred to also as the house of Israel. Pardon me, guys. I have to use a booster. I feel like a little kid. The seats and that I'm sitting in, I feel like I'm sitting on the floor. Uh, anyway, so the remnant comes in there. But we also have a scripture where it says, yet all Israel shall be saved. I believe that's in Romans 11 where, where, where Paul uh, speaks about that there. All Israel shall be saved. And so there's really even more. I'm probably going to have to go into this even deeper, even at another time, because this is very fascinating subject to me, mainly because when I saw this one in the Apocalypse of Peter, it began to make more sense from the standpoint of the book of Revelation. But if you remember, there's another scripture where it talks about that, uh, the, let's see, what is it? Judah, either Judah or Ephraim. I forget which one it uses the name in there in the scripture. And again, I'm just going to paraphrase this. He shall not lift up his foot against Judah, for the house of Judah gets saved first, then the house of Israel. And this is exactly what happens when, uh, when we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Judah receives it first. They come out of the upper room. And then, of course, the remnant of the house of Israel is standing there. 
then they end up believing. And then, of course, we know the answer after uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. They say, uh, what must we do to receive the Holy Spirit? And Peter said, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, paraphrasing that, I don't, in case I make something wrong as I say that. Now, but then we come across this beautiful passage that is over here in uh in, in this book called the uh, Apocalypse of Peter. And now we're having that uh, the house of Israel comes in at the end of days. And, you know, and, and, and at one point, because I've been looking at a lot of scriptures that I realized was fulfilled 2,000 years ago and trying to correct some of the old uh, old school theology, now I realize that there's still yet a fulfillment of the house of Israel. Now it's not, we can't say that it is, you know, my thought, let me put it like this here. When I wrote the book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? I used to write it from the concept that the, that the house of Israel are the 10 lost tribes. They're still lost. They never came back. <clears throat> and I totally had not even realized that Peter had clearly identified them as being home on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, or at least Paul writing that particular book. Uh, I had not paid attention to the fact that Jesus had said, go only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel when they went abroad. Notice they went abroad when he sent them out uh, and he told them to go out and go on to the, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it wasn't for the fact they didn't know where they were. Jesus sent them to them, and they preached the gospel. But So by the day of Pentecost, now the house of Israel, or a remnant of them, fulfilling Isaiah that we just read there, uh, was it chapter 9, I believe it was, uh, fulfilling that scripture that the house, even though Israel is as the, as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them would return. And so on the day of Pentecost, a remnant is there. But yet there's still a fulfillment, and I'm gonna, it's going to really make me have to go back to, to Romans 11 again after I thought I'd made a mistake on that in the book where Paul says, thus shall fulfill the scripture, all Israel shall be saved. Now I realize that does include those that are being grafted in, but at the same time, now that I see this in Peter, I realize there's still yet another awakening coming is what I'm getting at here. And what's interesting in this book here is Peter is basically, it's almost like they're waking up too. It's like they're, they realize, and let me read this again, this, this part right here. Have you not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Verily I say to you, when its twigs have sprouted forth in the last days. So it's like it's having a revival. Then shall false Christ come and awake expectation. Boy, if that's not happening, that's where, you know, and, and I, when I say this, I'm not trying to pick on Rabbi Shapira, the Messianic rabbi, uh, you know, Yitzhak Shapira. It's not to pick on him. I believe the man really loves the Lord, but the problem is he's trying to bring uh, the, the, uh, a lot of the believers in South America, he's trying to place them underneath rabbis in Israel. You know, that's that's you know, that's totally false. We can't do that. You cannot take them and put that's taking the dog back to the vomit and having him lick it up. You can't do that. And so he may be very sincere, but he's it's totally wrong. So it goes on to say, um, Come away, they come, they come to wake expectation, saying, I am the Christ who has now come into the world. Now, that this is what's interesting, and I did notice scholars when I was looking at some of the scholarly reviews on this, they point out the obvious here, and that is it goes from a plural Christ, which ones that are in the word Christ, keep in mind that means anointed one, Mashiach. Mashiach just means anointed. So there is a group of them that are awaking expectation, but now it goes to the singular. I am the Christ who has now come into the world. So now we have one trying to mimic as if he were Jesus Christ, so to speak. 
And when they perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they turn away and deny him whom our fathers praised. Now, that's a little confusing for me. I, I, I'm still trying to unravel that part right there. You know, what part is this applying to? The first Christ whom they crucified and therein sinned a great sin, but this deceiver is not the Christ. And when they reject him, he shall slay them with the sword, and there shall be many martyrs. Now, that is very obvious. So the house of Israel, this new, uh, and I don't even want to call them a remnant. It's basically the, the remaining part of the house of Israel in the last days, or the descendants of their children. They are recognizing that Jesus Christ truly is the son of God. And of course, we find as we go a little further, he sends uh, them Enoch and Elijah to teach them that this is a deceiver who must come into the world to do signs and wonders in order to deceive. So they're being warned by these two prophets of this false Messiah. And, and, and it really, I mean, let's face it, it's got to come out of Israel. I, I hate to make it look that way because it's nothing against the Jewish people. But you got to remember, the Jewish people living in Israel today, they, they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so for them, they're still looking for a Messiah to come. And one way or the other, they're going to have a Messiah. And I kind of wonder if not maybe the house of Israel, the new tree that puts forth its branches, it, maybe it's global, yes. And then again, there may be remnants of that house of Israel in the modern state of Israel today that will wake up. Um, so anyway, if, if we can hold off for a little bit on the questions, because I'll get totally, I'll lose my thought here. and I won't be able to, to keep going on the same path. So I'll, I'll, I will come back to your questions, though, guys, in just a little bit. So anyway, that's that's where this really gets all mixed up, right? So, but if you go to Revelation, and this is in chapter six, one of the things that it did, it answered my question about the fifth seal. And we read the fifth seal, we this is what it says. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, were should be fulfilled. All right. Now, it is obvious now from what we read over in the Apocalypse of Peter that the original saints, the original apostles who were Jewish apostles, they were martyred, they were killed, and they're saying, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? He tells them to rest for a little season until it's fulfilled upon their brethren. The only ones that could be their brethren would be either more of the house of Judah or, or the house of Israel, or that may be... Uh, wrapped up together. Now, here's what's interesting. Think about the word rest in there, too. If we go here in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, we read here, uh, let's see. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Also, Moses was as, you know, as also was Moses faithful in all his house. 
For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he has he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, okay, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, the day of the temptation in the wilderness. Uh, I believe, by the way, that too, that is in Psalm 95. Where your fathers tempted me and provoked me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so i swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest take heed brethren lest there be any of you who have an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living god all right now notice the part about rest i'm bringing this out because revelation in the fifth seal, he told them to rest for a little season until that what happens to their brethren, right? If we continue on, though, into chapter 4 of Hebrews, he says this, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left unto us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For he which have, for he, excuse me, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of a seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing, therefore, it remaineth that some must enter therein, they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, so the thing is, entering into Christ is what they did. And of course, we know now they are in his rest. So, and, and again, the, the important thing is, this is not speaking of the Sabbath, you know, and it's not to say that, that it's not to speak against the Sabbath, it's just letting us know that that particular type of rest is actually resting in Christ until that final day of resurrection, I guess is what we would say there. Now, but it doesn't end there. If you go into Revelation 17, this is also important because you got to remember when we were looking at the 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 fifth seal and he saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held the question comes up who slays them right who's who's going to be the one that does it i mean if we look at the apocalypse of Peter, when Peter talks about this and he says that many of them are going to be martyrs, they're going to be martyrs because they reject this one that's claiming to be the Christ. 
I mean, imagine how religious this will appear to be on the earth. I mean, somebody that's supposed to be, that will be able to do miracles and everything else you could imagine. But yet, he's not of God. And in fact, there, there's the miracles are going to be so great and mighty that God has to send Enoch and Elijah to be able to get them to understand that this is totally incorrect. That this is actually the deceiver that the scriptures promised that was going to come into the world. And as a result for their steadfast stand that they will take, they become martyrs as well. So the martyrdom is actually entering into the rest. Because even God said to those that were martyred in the fifth seal, he said, rest for a little season. And that rest was in Christ Jesus. All right, now we come to Revelation chapter 17, though, and we look at this. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come unto me hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, who sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornications, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones, pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now notice, that's the blood of two different groups of people. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. All right, we don't have to go any further as far as on what we're really looking at right here, uh, and because I want to be able to get to you guys' questions. So I'm going to kind of wrap this up here in just a second. So when we look at that, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, there you go right there. Now we know, and of course, this is Mystery Babylon. Now, do you remember why she's called Mystery Babylon? Uh, give me one second here. The reason why she's called Mystery Babylon is because what it is, is um, she's called Mystery Babylon because when Israel was down in Babylon, when they went into captivity, the house of Judah, not the house of Israel, but the house of Judah, they went into captivity in Babylon, and then that's when they co-mingled their seed with the very peoples of the land, and that was not the peoples of the Babylonians. That was the peoples that went into captivity with them that God told them not to intermarry among them, the Hittite, Perzite, Jebusites. Except, etc., that were in amongst them. Why? Because they were already known to be commingled with the fallen angels, the Nephilim, as we know from the scripture where it says that the, that uh, that Enoch, that that the uh, that, that his sons were from the Nephilim. Literally in the Hebrew, it says from the Nephilim. And so the reason why then Judah or, or this woman, this mystery Babylon is called the mother of harlots. Because see, Judah had gone all this time. The house of Israel had done that sin. They had already mingled in amongst those nations. And that's why God drove them out of Israel. Gosh, how many? 700 years before Judah ever was driven into exile. But then she does it. And even God says, I believe it's in Hosea, he talks about, you know, he said, now our sister Judah has played the harlot also. 
and was just as bad. You know, uses different names for them. And that and is either Hosea or Joel, one of those books there where that happens at. And he talks about that. So Mystery Babylon, that harlot, is actually the house of Judah. And we know this too because Jesus identifies it when he says that uh, when he tells over in Matthew 23, he said, you are a gener you are vipers, a generation of serpents. And then he placed all the bloodshed, he indicted the Pharisees for all the bloodshed that had ever happened, going all the way back uh, to Abel in the Garden of Eden. Wow, what do you know? How could that be? If you'll notice, you could actually see how that is because in another verse in, in Matthew 23, he said, he said, you know, you say if we'd been in the days of, of the prophets, we would have not have been, you know, guilty in the in the blood of the prophets. He said, you, in other words, you're admitting that that's your fathers. He said, fill you up the measure of your fathers. Wow. I mean, think how strong that was. And then Jesus turns around and he says, You're, you know, you're 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 basically a bunch of reptilians. And it's the thing is, and of course he does say, How can you escape the damnation of hell? Now in the Hebrew Matthew, I like that version a little bit better. He says, How could you escape the damnation of hell except you turn in repentance? So he realized, and why? Because my thinking is the Hebrew version is more accurate because why? Whether it be their mother or their father, because you got to remember when they mingled that seed, they mingled it both, both men and girls both were mingled in Babylon with the with these nations that were early Neph Nephilim nations, right? So either their mother or their father still were from a pure bloodline. Even though the children are born, they still got a mother or father. So they, it's not to say that they're altogether bad. So there's still that possibility you could repent. And that's the beauty of Christ. That's the beauty of him and his mercy is that there is that place to be able to repent. But the thing is, the people just, you know, it's like in another place he says to the to the apostles, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that's not talking about the, a sewing needle. That's a, a fortress. That's what they called the, the gate where the camel had to get down and basically crawl to get him inside the fortress. And if you know anything about camels, and I don't know a whole lot, but I've been around them enough when I lived in Israel, they are some ornery creatures, and they do not like going down uh, to get down like that to have to crawl, let alone crawl. Getting them to squat down like that, they're not happy about that. But getting them to crawl, well, you can forget it. That just ain't going to happen unless you may have a really good relationship with your camel. Um, Anyway, so I wanted to show you that, but the other thing is I wanted to show you real quick, and then I'm going to take your questions then, is that remember, she had committed fornication, not only there, but also with the kings of the earth. It wasn't just limited to what happened in Babylon, but with all the, you know, she's drunk with their, you know, she made the kings of the earth who have committed fornication, inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And that's not necessarily so much in, in child mixing there. That's just in getting them to go along with her doctrinal beliefs or her ideology. And so what I did is I pulled up, and I've done this before for you guys, but I'll just do it again, you know, right? You begin to look, and this is what I find fascinating, right? doesn't matter what leader of the world it is. Putin is no better. And... Um, you know, so you have Putin there, and he's with the chief rabbi, Chabad rabbi of Russia. And, of course, you have Rabbi Menachem Schneerson in the background. This is a great big movement, by the way, that has the tentacles in every government around the world. doesn't matter where it's at. This one really bothered me the most because it was Robert Kennedy. Uh, and uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., that's his father. And he met, and I read the article that was published. He had met uh, a couple of times with uh, with the Rebbe there. And uh, but yet John Kennedy, you know, that man really. When I did the interview with Phil uh, uh, Attorney on the USS Liberty, he shared with me that John F. Kennedy, he really 
was hard on Israel and on their leaders. And he said that he would not stand by and fund them militarily to drive off the Palestinians from the land that had been living there for the last 2,000 years. He said he would not stand by and be a part of that. So John seemed to have a different notion than what Robert did. Uh, but that, so, you know, I, I don't know what to think of that. I really don't. Then, of course, we know that uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, he, it was actually, though, Carter that, that kicked off uh, the movement with the Chabad organization in the presidential off, office there. Uh, then you have Bill Gates. And there's many, many, many world leaders, you know, or different names. Zelensky. So then you wonder why does Putin and Zelensky fight each other when they're when their bosses are both the same set of guys? Well, they're carrying out the orders to be able to kill off the Slovak, uh, Slo uh, the um, uh, as Edward Hudo said, this the uh, Slavic peoples of that land. They want to kill them off. Uh, Trump, no different. Trump, very, in, in fact, his own son-in-law, his daughter also are majorly in the Chabad movement there. Uh, Netanyahu, he's actually there with the German chancellor, uh, or president, sorry, with the German president. And if you'll see the picture there at his hand there, he was uh, showing him the picture with him with uh, Rebbe Menachem Schneerson. Uh, and Schne and Rebbe uh, Schneerson was asking him in a video that I've shared with you guys before, uh, what are you going to do to bring the coming of the Messiah? And he says, I'm trying. He said, you're not doing enough. Try harder. And of course, what he's talking about is if you got to go out and kill everybody, do it. It's the frankest doctrine uh, that the more evil you do, the better chance you have of the Messiah coming. So that's the frankest doctrine. Yeah, so Netanyahu shares personal inspirations from the Rebbe with, I'm sorry, Australia's prime minister. I'm sorry. I Stand corrected. I got one on the German chancellor or the German president. This is the one I think on the, yeah, the German president visits Chabad rabbi's home uh, here. So it's, it's no matter where you go in the world, the Pope included, and this is Holocaust survivors, uh, but he has met multiple times with Chabad rabbis as well. Uh, it's just, it's everywhere you go. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of Stop. I had somebody in here trying to get in and I didn't see that. I apologize. So, um,